In 1884, a small steam-powered train loaded with passengers traversed a wooden bridge at Grassy Sound and arrived on a mostly uninhabited island. This was Anglesey, the first community of Five Mile Beach. The history of the Wild Woods can be traced back to the mid-1800s, when the tiny fishing village of Anglesey was established on the northernmost portion of the island. The Hereford Inlet in Anglesey was a very deep channel, and all the, the Swedes and, and Norwegians from Europe came over here to do their fishing. It was quite a big industry for Wildwood because that was really the only income that was in existence at the time. There was a, a shallow uh, right off Hereford Inlet, so when their fishing smacks would come over here, if they weren't very careful, they would ground on there and uh, ruin their ship. That is what brought the United States government here to put a lighthouse right at that corner. They called it the Hereford Inlet Lighthouse, which is there today. The development of Anglesey as a resort community began in 1879, when the Five Mile Beach Improvement Company began clearing the land, selling lots, and building cottages for wealthy Philadelphians. When the Anglesey Railroad was completed, growth of the budding resort seemed assured, and Anglesey was quickly dubbed the youthful queen of seaside resorts. John Burke, along with several wealthy investors, began development of attractive land in the center of Five Mile Beach. They named their community Holly Beach, after the abundant and beautiful holly bushes that grew on this portion of the island. Burke hired William H. Bright of Philadelphia to run his real estate office. He came here in the mid-1800s and uh, he was uh, rather interested on the, on the beachfront where there was a lot of surf fishing. The guys would come down and, and do a lot of surf fishing off the front because there wasn't very much in the way of houses, but a few houses along the waterfront. But that's all, and they were just more or less uh, shacks just built there for the fishermen's use. When he came here, he saw a lot here, and he, he just loved it here. And uh, he would probably buy a uh, section of land maybe uh, an acre of ground with trees and so forth on it, because uh, he could buy it for a song. There was nothing here, and so it was very cheap. But at any rate, he would tear down the trees and, and try to get the roots out and clear things up in that manner. Then he would take his horse and wagon and go down the old Indian trail all the way down the front onto our beach, and he'd fill up the wagon with sand from the sand dunes off the beach, and he'd bring it up here into town, and then he'd uh, level it off so that he could possibly then sell it for five dollars down and five dollars a month. And in those days, that sort of thing was almost unheard of. But that's the only way they could move uh, here. There was nothing, no, no city, no town. In 1888, Holly Beach built a wooden walkway that was laid directly on the sand. The walkway was constructed in sections so it could be taken apart and stored away during the winter months. Between Anglesey and Holly Beach was a dense 90-acre forest that many of the locals referred to as the jungle. A wilderness of tangled underbrush and creeping climbing vines, of almost hidden pools and ponds of water framed in a setting of jungle vegetation, Francis Peak. Through the forest ran a narrow road that was once an old Indian trail. It was used by the Lenape Indians on their hunting and fishing expeditions to the island prior to the 1800s. When the tide was in, this was the only pathway between Anglesey and Holly Beach. In 1883, Philip Baker and his brothers Latimer and J. Thompson Baker purchased the 90-acre forest. Initially, they named their development Florida City, but wisely changed it to Wildwood. It is indeed well named. Until I saw it, I did not know such variety of trees, vines, climbing shrubs, and wildflowers so intimately grouped together can be found in our whole land. Charles Hassler, 1890. 
One of these strange twisted trees was a cedar formed in the shape of a W. Known by the locals as the W tree, it became the symbol of Wildwood. The Baker brothers used an illustration of the tree in all their early advertisements. And when the boroughs of Holly Beach and Wildwood consolidated in 1912, the image was added to the seal of the city of Wildwood. Like her neighbors to the north and south, the Bakers began to clear the land and lay out streets and lots. Attracting investors and vacationers from the big cities would not be an easy task. Just getting to the island was an arduous journey. A corduroy road was built extending from Rio Grande to Holly Beach, the present Rio Grande Avenue. This was a great improvement over the boat trip, but I cannot say that it made comfortable riding. I usually arrived in a condition of seasickness. Bessie Bristol Mason, 1883. Travel to the island became easier when the Anglesey Railroad was completed. After arriving in Anglesey, visitors would have to walk or take a coach into Wildwood and Holly Beach. A year after the West New Jersey Railroad took over the Anglesey Line, tracks were laid to Wildwood Station, and the $1 excursion began. You could go to Philadelphia and back for a dollar. And we had excursions, like on Washington's birthday and different uh, holidays during the year. And I think everybody in Wildwood would take that special. And there was, sometimes there wasn't any room to sit down. And I remember one time, my grandmother and I sat on a truck in the baggage car because we couldn't even get a seat on the train. It was so packed. By 1888, Wildwood consisted of four muddy streets. Cedar, oak, pine, and Wildwood. A 60-foot observation tower and the excursion pavilion. In 1890, Gilbert Blaker leased the excursion pavilion and expanded it seaward. Two years later, the pavilion was completely destroyed by a horrific storm. Undaunted, Blaker rebuilt the pier into what would become Wildwood's first amusement pier. During the last decade of the century, development of Five Mile Beach accelerated at a rapid pace. By 1898, there were over two dozen hotels, numerous boarding houses, and vacant lots were selling for a song. Dad wanted to get lots sold here because they were easy to sell, and he could fill them with beach sand for no cost. It did start to, to uh, snowball a little bit uh, because it, he was selling to these uh, surf fishermen and people that had the Hottens Harbor with fishing industry and so forth. And it started to sell and he was selling these lots pretty quick. So he calls his brothers from uh, Philadelphia and said, look, this is getting to be a big thing down here and it's, it's getting out of hand and I can't handle it all. So you guys better come down here. So the four bright brothers were very active in the startup, really, of uh, Wildwood. The Baker brothers, who owned a sizable portion of real estate, spent heavily to advertise their seaside resort. During the summer of 1890, over 40 special excursion trains arrived on Five Mile Beach, each carrying as many as 400 passengers. Wildwood's second amusement pier was constructed just north of Blaker's Pier. Built at a cost of $18,000, the casino offered hot saltwater baths and a 500-foot-long fishing pier. Bill Blaker's place and his competitor across the street, they were competing. At one time, they put a fence up so people couldn't get across from one to the other. They had boardwalks down. Plus, that was the big thing, to promenade at night, show off your gown, show off your... After dinner, they would go out and promenade. And they wouldn't promenade if somebody never walked down. So the thing was to get people to walk to your place of business.
Throughout the late 1800s and early 1900s, the Wildwoods were regarded as one of the best fishing resorts on the East Coast. Shortly before the turn of the, the century into the 20th century, uh, there was a, um, a type of fishing called pound fishing that was developed uh, in uh, the uh, waterfront areas of New York State. There were four pound fisheries off this island. And initially, they rowed from the beaches out to where the pound poles were located, which was approximately two miles. In 1908, Otten's Harbor was dredged, and it gave them a secure harbor where the boats could be berthed. They then would go through what was called Turtle Gut Inlet, which is about halfway through Wildwood Crest. It doesn't exist today. They would then go out to the pound poles, bring the fish in, and it would be shipped to the markets in, in Philadelphia because there wasn't a direct rail line to New York area. And then Philadelphia would in turn ship it to New York. They were uh, catching monumental amounts of fish. Unbelievable, something like 22 freight cars of fish left here on one day in uh, the late 1890s, early 1900s. During the first decade of the 20th century, Wildwood's development surged ahead. In 1900, Wildwood's first significant boardwalk was completed. First boardwalk was built on Atlantic Avenue. And it was a, a small raised boardwalk for about four or six blocks. That boardwalk was changed to a full raised boardwalk with railing and seats along it and pavilions. Five years later, Holly Beach's first elevated promenade was dedicated. The boardwalk would now span two and a half miles from Anglesey to Holly Beach. Traveling between the resort towns was made much easier when the Five Mile Beach Electric Railroad finished laying tracks down Atlantic Avenue, and passengers could ride the trolley from Anglesey into Holly Beach and back. The trolleys came in then, and they ran, the bull was one way there, and then just inside a little bit was a trolley ran right down the middle of Atlantic Avenue. They had to build an electric plant here to provide electricity to run the trolleys. Along came the trolleys, along came the electric plant. So electric lighting came into proficiency then. Uh, they put electric lighting along the boardwalk. Between 1900 and 1910, Blaker's Pavilion and the casino were expanded almost yearly. And in 1905, the new $150,000 Ocean Pier made its debut. By the end of the decade, the boardwalk's west side was lined with candy stores, ice cream parlors, restaurants, and a multitude of retail shops. With the phenomenal growth of Holly Beach and Wildwood, the Baker Brothers purchased the land south of Holly Beach down to Turtle Gut Inlet and set forth developing Wildwood Crest. It was manifest destiny that the silent waste of long neglected beach at the southern end of the island should be made to serve the needs of the present. Streets and avenues have been traced across its now elevated surface and a number of cottages have been erected. Philip Baker. The Ocean Crest Hotel and Crest Pier, completed in 1906, were Wildwood Crest's first major resort properties and a sign of the young community's progress. When it was first built, it was right on the water. At high tide, the water would come underneath it. They had bowling alley on it, a huge ballroom with bleachers on each side of it and a nice stage. And they had a big band there called uh, Paul White's Orchestra. And they played uh, six nights a week for dancing. And on Wednesday afternoons would be for children. 
and we would go and they would teach us how to, how to dance and then we would play some games. And, um, and then at night it was strictly for the adults. They had a walk all the way around the back part of the dance floor so that you could walk at night and see the water and the dancers would go by back there and cool off and then come back in during intermission. It was beautiful. In 1909, John Ackley, a prominent real estate investor and auctioneer, organized the first baby parade. Attracting more than 150 entrants, the parade quickly became popular and within a few years over 400 entrants competed for prizes. Wildwood Baby Parade was a big event. The ladies of the Civic Club always used to be judges. We would judge the baby parade, the contestants before the parade, and then we would go up to the stand up in Wildwood and watch the parade go by. In 1914, a beauty pageant was added to the parade, with the winner being crowned as Queen Oceana. And then there was always a luncheon for the queen and her court and the judges, and that was always nice. It was always a fun day. It was always a fun day. At the end of the 1913 season, the Reading Line reported that it had transported three times as many passengers into Wildwood as it had to Cape May. As an indicator of Five Mile Beach's increasing popularity, Wildwood's postmaster reported that in 1914, over one million postcards had been mailed from the resort. And by 1915, the population of Wildwood had eclipsed both Cape May and Ocean City. On January 16, 1920, the 18th Amendment, prohibiting the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcohol, was enacted. The Coast Guard were supposedly the protectors of the Volstead Act, and they would there to seek out rum runners, local rum runners. But it went on for years here to a point where uh, one of the most magnificent homes in, in North Wildwood, for instance, was owned by a chief petty officer in charge of the unit who was in the Coast Guard, a home that, you know, you would pay a king's ransom for. Otten's Harbor was a hotbed of that type activity. The locals who participated in this participated some as owners of trucking lines, some as owners of what had been licensed premises before Prohibition, and some as speakeasies during Prohibition. We had at least three speakeasies uh, that I'm aware of under the Wildwood Boardwalk. It was quite typical in the operation of these places as, as far as liquor, not with beer they wouldn't do this, but they would put sinks behind a bar. In each one they would have a different type of uh, hard liquor and they would mix drinks by just dipping into this. The minute uh, the federal agents walked into the place, the stopper would come out of the sink and everything went down the drain. I don't think this is unique to this area. It was a law that was generally not respected by anyone because it was a ridiculous law, and it gave rise to an awful lot of the things we see on TV. My grandfather had a, uh, a bootlegger by the name of Sharky, and he had a big Marmon car, and underneath the uh, body he had a big copper tank, and he used to go up to Tamaqua, Pennsylvania, and get a load of uh, white lightning and bring it back, and he would bring it into us in a, a quart bottle, and everything was called Golden Wedding. We had two express companies in Wildwood here, which we don't have anymore. One was called KK Kirby, and the other guy was called Loeffler. They used to take the trucks and go up and pick up the booze, North Jersey, Pennsylvania, or wherever, 
And one guy would call the state police up and rat on them and tell them that Kirby's coming down with a load of booze. And the state police would catch them, take an ax and chop all the booze up, and it would run right down the gutter. And I used to sit there and look at all that good beer going down the gutter. Woo, man, that was terrible. It functioned as if there were no such law here. In addition to all else, you're talking about people on vacation in hot weather, and obviously, uh, uh, you know, they, their tongues were hanging out, and uh, uh, so these places all did quite well. A redefining of American life occurred during the 20s. Modern conveniences and mass production provided a new sense of freedom that was as intoxicating as bathtub gin. By the end of the decade, over half of all American families owned a car. On Labor Day of 1928, while 37,000 passengers took the train to Wildwood, four times as many arrived by car. Air travel was not yet possible for the masses, and most people considered pilots daredevils. So when Bill James came to Wildwood, the crowds gathered to watch the spectacle. He was an attraction because he was the only airplane in Cape May County at that time. Airplanes were not as common as they are nowadays. And uh, he would hop passengers, take up passengers right off our Wildwood Beach. My job was to go along the cars and ask people if they wanted to take a ride in, uh, in the airplane. And uh, in those days, they hand propped the uh, engine. And of course, I, as a kid, I sat in the cockpit and held the stick back so the thing wouldn't move. And no brakes on those airplanes in those days. Later on, uh, the banners uh, started to evolve, and he was one of the first to start hauling banners up and down the beach. Theaters were opening all across the nation in big cities and small towns. By 1922, Bill Hunt owned no less than seven theaters in the Wildwoods. There was always so many movies to go to. There was the Shore and the Casino and the Blaker. There was the Strand, the Regent, and the, they were all Hunt's theaters in those days. We used to go to the movies on bargain night. I'm not sure of the night the bargain night was, but it used to be a dime. And I lived on Taylor Avenue, and we, of course, we walked in those days. I can remember when it was silent movies there. <laughs> and they had uh, uh, a woman by the name of uh, Marion uh, Dennison, and she played the piano. Uh, and we would go there on, I mean, uh, Saturday afternoons and matinees, and you know, they had the um, westerns on, and she played the piano, and you would. <laughs> And when the exciting part came, she would make it sound real loud, and uh, it was interesting. I can remember Saturday nights, uh, it was a big night out, you know, because uh, we didn't have television then, and, uh, and it was go to the movies. W.C. Hunt, we call him the old man, he expected you to do everything. If you were manager of the Shore Theater, you were electrician, plumber, painter. And he approached me one day about painting the kick uh, space uh, all around the whole theater. Now, this is a 1,400-seat theater, big. So I told him I can't do it. And, well, uh, and we got in an argument about it, and I politely told him to stick the job and walked out. But he called me back and called me in his office and he explained about Hunt's theaters and uh, how he was started with one theater. And before the conference was over, he had me in tears. <laughs> in 1927, Convention Hall was completed. Between Wildwood's expansive, gently sloping beach and the new convention center, Wildwood was now able to attract the large conventions that previously went to Atlantic City. Back in the 1920s, the uh, Chamber of Commerce sent an ad to the New York Times, come and visit Wildwood, world's finest and safest bathing beach. 
So they got a letter back from the New York Times saying, well, we'll be glad to run your ad, but we really can't allow you to call yourself the world's finest and safest bathing beach because everybody wants to say that, and we'll just say uh, you have a fine beach or something like that. So my father wrote back and said, uh, we would be glad to have you send a couple of people down here for a weekend at our expense and uh, let them look over the, the beach. So they did. They sent a couple people down for the weekend, guests of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they looked over the beach, the boardwalk, and according to the story, they went back to New York and ran the ad as originally scheduled, Wildwood, world's finest and safest bathing beach. With the tremendous influx of vacationers to the Wildwoods, crowds on the beaches swelled. Responding to the increasing number of bathers, Wildwood increased its beach patrol from a captain and 18 guards in 1920 to a corps of 52 guards in 1927. Outpacing the increasing number of bathers, the Wildwood Beach continued to expand at an incredible rate. Wildwood has also been very blessed uh, by, by nature with the, the ocean continuing to go out. I'm sure it's been observed by others. Uh, when I was a kid, Atlantic Avenue was uh, right along the beach. And now, of course, it's gone over to ocean, gone over to Beach Drive, where the ocean keeps going further and further out. On October 24, 1929, the stock market plunged to record depths and the nation sank into what became known as the Great Depression. Times were sort of tough during the Depression because I knew some friends whose mother and father were, and father were fishermen. And uh, at that time, that uh, they said they had, and especially in the winter, to live practically on potatoes and fish. Some of them <laughs> jokingly said they had it three times a day now. During the Depression, you got paid part in money and part in what they called script. Each town would have these, uh, look like a dollar bill printed, but it would say on there, City of North Wildwood script or something like that. And it would be in various denominations, one, fives, and tens, and things like that. So a lot of stores would take it, a lot of stores wouldn't take it. At the end of the Depression, the city was supposed to reimburse anybody who had taken the script in, which they did, but at that time, you didn't know whether they were going to do it or not. So that's why a lot of stores wouldn't take it. We lived on script, what we called script. It was nothing but a piece of paper. It had no value. It wasn't worth a dime. We had a few uh, uh, realtors around town that had made money with the motels and so forth, and uh, they'd take that money, and uh, they'd take the school teachers, and they'd give them 50 cents on a dollar for their pieces of script. A few years later, when things started to get back in the, in the groove again, people started to make money, people getting jobs, uh, why then, uh, the government stepped in and redeemed all of that dead script. wasn't worth a dime, but it was when the government stepped in because they redeemed it. And when they redeemed it, uh, the realtors and so forth around, they'd become millionaires overnight. The economic hardship severely affected resort communities, and the wild woods were no exception. Declining sales and reduced profits compelled the Reading Railroad and Pennsylvania Railroad to consolidate. Around 1933, the Pennsylvania Railroad and the Reading Railroad merged and formed the Pennsylvania Reading Seashore Lines. And they tore up the track across the meadows from Anglesey to the junction, but they kept the track from the crest where they had a loop which they used to turn the trains. The trains would go down, go around the loop, and then head out. And uh, they would go down as far as Oak Avenue and they put a curve in so they followed the Reading tracks across the meadows through West Wildwood. Piers and hotels suffered greatly during the 30s and even the great Ocean Pier was unable to ride out the storm. In 1935, Ocean Pier was sold to William Hunt at a great loss to its owners. 
Hunt's success in the theater business made him both wealthy and confident in his capacity to resurrect the status of the great peer. In bold defiance of the economic climate, he promptly began to make immediate renovations to the pier. In 1938, he called upon the renowned Philadelphia Toboggan Company to build and install a roller coaster, Ferris wheel, and the Jack and Jill Sky Ride. Operated by Ralph Carl and Sebastian Ramagosa, the casino attempted to compete for customers by offering more than just amusement rides. In 1938, they added an attraction called the Wall of Death, in which a lion rode in the sidecar of a motor car as it was driven up steeply banked walls. On October 5th, while the boardwalk was beginning to close for the season, Tuffy, the 600-pound male lion, escaped from his cage. So they called the city hall and uh, the neighbors and said, oh, send the cops down here because this wild lion's out here. He's going to kill people and went on with a big story. So my brother-in-law, Millard Camel, and he and uh, Johnny, uh, Johnny Gears was the expert pistol shot. They searched all day up and down the boardwalk and underneath all wherever they could do. So when they were going down the, the police officers were going up and down the beach, the military camera looks under the boardwalk and it was dusk. Then you could see and you saw two little eyes back in there. And he said, Johnny, come over here. Do you think that's him? So Johnny says, I know that's him. So of course he pops. The lion right smack here and that was the end of the lion. On a lighter note, the Big Band era was born, and Wildwood's great ballrooms played host to a number of noteworthy entertainers. This was the era of the big bands, and the big bands would come here for a week or maybe even two weeks and play at the Starlight Ballroom, and, and Guy Hunt was a friend of my mother, and he would recommend to the bands that they stay at my mother's hotel, the Hotel Oceanic. I remember going down to the beach one day with, uh, with Glenn Miller and playing quoits, I beat him in quoits. He was a better trombone player, but I could beat him in quoits. I remember the Andrews sisters came one time. Uh, they had never been in the ocean, so my mother said, will you take these girls down and show them about going into the ocean? And so, so I took the Andrews sisters down and gave them their instructions on their first ocean dip. Uh, oh, a couple of Artie Shaw stories. Artie Shaw was a great favorite here in Wildwood, and he was a great favorite of the Hotel Oceanic, except one night he came home he was un, not satisfied with the way the band had played that night at the Starlight Ballroom in Wildwood, and he said, uh, come on, fellas, we got to get your horns out. we got to rehearse some of these numbers a little bit. And here it was midnight. Everybody in the hotel was asleep, and my mother's apartment's right there by the lobby, and all of a sudden she hears the Artie Shaw Orchestra live. She ran out in the lobby. She says, Artie, she said, what are you doing? She said, everybody in the hotel is asleep. you got to stop right away. So very sheepishly, they put everything away. And... Toward the end of the 1930s, the economy gradually turned upward. And during the summer of 1941, Wildwood saw record crowds on the boardwalk. The summer before the war, summer 41, was a really good summer. Because everybody was already getting into war production and uh, people had money already. Anybody that wanted to work could get a job. So summer 41 was a really busy summer. December 7th, 1941. Pearl Harbor is attacked and America is suddenly thrust into war. We were riding in a car with another couple from school when we heard the news about the Pearl Harbor. <laughs> and of course, uh, at the time, they weren't uh, enlisting the men then. I mean, you didn't have to sign up. But then when they started to do that, all the boys, of course, enlisted. And then rather than be called, they felt it was better to enlist, so they enlisted. Seaside communities on the eastern shore began to make immediate preparations for the possibility of invasion. Air raid drills were held, and concrete lookout towers were constructed. It was well known that German submarines were operating just a few miles off the coast. One story, which I was always told uh, was true, 
because uh, my friends, they all knew him uh, after the war, and he was a crewman on one of the submarines, and they would actually come in on a rubber raft and uh, come ashore and uh, buy bread and stuff and, uh, and go back. And uh, people never knew he was a uh, uh, German, uh, German sub. The Varinger, an 8,500-ton Norwegian oil tanker, is torpedoed just off the coast, and the Navy orders an immediate blackout along the entire New Jersey coastline. The boardwalk was uh, blue lights, all blue. And uh, a lot of the places of business, they had curtains, so you wouldn't reflect the light because the German submarines could, could silhouette a ship against the light on the boardwalk. I always thought that German submarines could still silhouette a, a ship because they were bombing the heck out of uh, ships, torpedoing ships out here uh, all up and down the whole Atlantic coast. The, the ships had to get from here over to England and France to supply troops and, and equipment but that had to come from the, the uh, oil refineries up the Delaware River. They all had to come down the Delaware River and they turn around to hit the Atlantic Ocean and Cape May Point, go, try to go around the point, but uh, Mr. German knew that. So when our ships came down there to go turn around Cape May Point, the subs would sit right out there and blow them out of the water. Uh, we lost 89 ships right off our coast, right out in front here. That brings up a, a rather sad subject on my part. During the night, before we had heard the, the booms and the bangs and the explosions going off the, the, uh, from the submarines that were sitting out there, and they hit a lot of our ships coming down. However, uh, when we went down to the beach, we picked up five of our boys off these tankers that had been blown up during the night, and they were laying on our beach. So uh, we got them and loaded them in the flatbed truck and brought them up here to this very room we're in now and laid those boys out here right on the floor. By the summer of 42, servicemen were a common sight on the boardwalk and in local establishments. Difficult times were headed for the Wildwoods. The Pennsylvania Reading Seashore Lines discontinued their special excursion trains. Two years later, the Electric Railway Company terminated all streetcar service in Wildwood. And restaurants were hit particularly hard as the government began rationing food. During the war, they closed down this dining room because it was hard to get food, it was hard to get enough help. And uh, in fact, I've got an old menu, I think, from 1942. It has about uh, six items on it. You know, that's all there was. <laughs> and I can remember my pop talking about, uh, you'd order a barrel of meat. You know, that's how you would have to order it. You, you couldn't just order, say, I want, X, I want top rounds, or I want steaks, or I want this. You would order a barrel of meat. It had come in with, uh, with whatever, was, you know, <laughs> you got whatever they sent you. So then you had to take that and make something out of it. On Christmas Day of 1943, one of the largest and most costly fires reduced Hunt's Ocean Pier to ashes. And in the blink of an eye, a grand institution had vanished. The wind-driven fire claimed the lives of two people and took a number of Wildwood establishments with it. Across from the pier was a, another theater called the Nixon Theater. Bud Dry, our secretary and treasurer, he, I met him there in the parking lot. And we had all uh, equipment for making uh, sets and uh, signs. And him and I got the bright idea we're going to try to haul some of this out. Well, what I'm getting at, all what I'm leading up to, he took note of the time for some reason or other, and we got one piece of machinery out. He said, we better get out of here, because here comes the flames. The Nixon Theater burned down in five minutes. Things were beginning to look up during the 1945 season. 
gasoline restrictions were withdrawn and blackouts were suspended as the threat of an enemy invasion diminished. The wild VJ celebration that ensued following Japan's surrender in August 1945 was inaugurated by servicemen swarming the boardwalk, hugging and kissing everyone in sight. The boys were coming home and spirits soared. The following season, people returned to the resorts in record numbers. Anytime you look at the boardwalk, it was just wall-to-wall -wall people packed all the time. After the war, we served about 260,000 people. And of course, in those days, this is where people came for vacation. You didn't fly to Jamaica because there was no such things as airplanes that flew there, you know. You didn't fly to Europe. You, uh, you didn't go to Myrtle Beach. You didn't go to Dewey Beach, Delaware. You didn't go to Cape Hatteras. Those places, I'll say, didn't exist. They existed on a map, but they weren't vacation destinations like they are today. You go back in those days and the Jersey Shore was it. I mean, everybody came here. Sebastian Ramagosa purchased several passenger trains from the New York World's Fair and started the sightseer. Watch the tram car, please, would become a familiar phrase heard up and down the lengthy promenade as the sightseer trams would become a boardwalk fixture. The post-war years of the 1950s brought a resurgence of prosperity and abundance as the nation's economy raced ahead at full speed. In 1951, an estimated 900,000 people visited the Wildwoods and parted with approximately $78 million. America's new taste for spending created a huge business boom for Wildwood merchants. By 1954, there were over 300 places to eat in the Wildwoods. That year, Ed Zaberer purchased the El Dorado Hotel and Restaurant and opened his first restaurant in the Wildwoods. Zaber's restaurant up in Anglesey was known for their Zaberized drinks. So you wouldn't just get a drink, you'd get a Zaberized drink. The restaurant had beautiful Tiffany lamps throughout, all kinds of antiques, pictures. That was the place um, to be seen, to eat, if you came to Cape May County. Really. And I know people that used to come to Cape May County just to eat there. No matter who you were, you, you got the same service. And he used to have a wall up there of all the entertainers that had come in and eaten there, even if they were playing up Atlantic City. But that, that was probably, I, I would have to say, and I would think everybody else would agree, um, it was the best, and, and sad to say, I don't think you'll ever see a restaurant as great as Zaber's was. The automobile of the 50s was not only a symbol of success, but became an integral part of the family vacation. In the Wildwoods, the new Park at the Door motels offered a casual, relaxing atmosphere for families with kids in tow. A uh, fellow we had here in town by the name of Ben Slenzig. He came over to my place and said, uh, I, I got a good idea. I'd like to start some uh, units, rental units here in town. And he said, uh, I got to have them wired and everything to take care of. So I said, well, wiring's about the only thing I want to handle. Ben built the Holly Courts. They were the first courts in the wild. In the early and late 50s, post-World War II, uh, what happened? Well, the social face of the United States changed. All of a sudden, uh, there was suburbia, and there was um, fundamental social things uh, that enabled Wildwood to exist um, in as we see as we see it today. People moved to suburbs. You know, vacations became an American thing, and they would get in their car and they would drive. Now, this was Wild was a was the blue collar Riviera, so all of the hotels, you know, had their own little fantasy because they were sort of you know, taking people on this fantasy vacation. Hunt finally rebuilt the Great Ocean Pier, 
which had been wiped out by fire in 1943. With the tragic fire still fresh in his memory, Hunt constructs the 55,000 square foot pier of fireproof steel and concrete. Renamed Hunt's Pier, it featured a 36 foot high wooden roller coaster and numerous attractions. To this day, you mentioned Hunt's Pier, they, uh, it was quite a unique pier because it had things like a jungle land, they had the, a mine ride. My job, I wired the whole thing for sound. I took care of all the uh, gimmicks, the rhinoceros, the elephant noises. The Wacky Shack was a dark ride, and it was dark. I mean, it was pitch black in there. After you got loaded on the loading platform, then you went through two doors, banged open and banged shut. And then now you were in the, in the dark. We had everything from a woman being sawed in half, screaming, and the, the light would come on, and here would be uh, some scary figure. Another big interesting ride was the mine ride, and that was a closed roller coaster, actually. Now you're going completely inside this big old mountain. The miners would be in there and plunge their explosion. And of course, we'd have the explosion would come at you, and then the things like timbers getting ready to fall on you. And then up top, we had a Indians attacking the covered wagon. Of course, you had the sound of, of the Indians and the guns going off and the Indians hooping. The fellow that designed it, it was on the West Coast. And without a doubt, it was right after Disney World opened up. And, uh, and it was, a, to me, it was a, a small scale steel of uh, Jungle Land down in uh, Disney World, you know. And of course the whole front was jungle-like uh, with bamboo uh, uh, walls. And in the back, all throughout the jungle, you had this background jungle music. On Pacific Avenue, both locals and tourists found some of the best shopping in the country. Wildwood was uh, the business center, the shopping center of Cape May County. Our Pacific Avenue was the busiest street in the whole county. It was a big center, and Wildwood uh, started in, in, as you know, the 50s and 60s. We were top of the mountain uh, because every big band in the world and every big entertainer in the world had to come to Wildwood. And most of them came here to try out their shows. If it went good, then they went on the circuit. At Convention Hall and Hunt Starlight Ballroom, one could swing and jitterbug to the sounds of the big band with the likes of Charlie Spivak, Vaughn Monroe, and Woody Herman. Well, the Starlight Ballroom was, a, was the dance hall in the summertime. When you were in there, it was a crowd. Uh, they would play uh, regular dances or jitterbugs, and in this place would be jumping, and you could feel the floor shaking. In the ceiling, they had uh, old, old tiles up there that, that uh, every once in a while a woman shake loose dropped. One thing I remember about, and, and, and mainly everybody remembers, the, the ball that was in the ceiling that rotated with the light shining on it. And you always had these little diamonds coming around the room just shining all over. In 1957, Dick Clark brought his little-known American bandstand to the Starlight Ballroom. The show was broadcast locally on radio until August 5th 1957, when it aired live on national TV, propelling Dick Clark and American Bandstand into instant stardom. Beginning in the 50s, the gravity-defying strapless swimsuit was all the rage. By 1960, it was the new eye-popping two-piece that really took the beach by storm. Named for the post-war nuclear bomb test at Bikini Atoll, the designer touted its explosive potential. In 1960, the National Marbles Tournament came to Wildwood. The tournament, which featured the best Mibsters from all over the United States and Canada, attracted national media attention. 
In later years, the winners would be crowned by such notorieties as Arthur Godfrey and Ed McMahon. Big name celebrities were not new to the Wildwoods. West of the boardwalk, the nightclubs routinely attracted many entertainers destined for fame. I remember the surf club, um, Bobby Rydell, Bobby Vitton, Fats Domino, the uh, Fifth Dimensions. They had three shows a night. And, and there were lines, you know, they literally turned people away. We had probably 15 clubs down here. They booked good entertainment, and, and uh, that was, I think, part of the reason we had the growth we did uh, in the 50s and 60s. You know, you could walk uh, two blocks any direction and go in and see a good show. I would say at the hours on the east side of town, you get done having the formal entertainment, the informal entertainment started with the entertainers on the west side of town. I remember my friend Jerome Taylor standing on our bikes in the back of Club Esquire looking through the window and seeing Dizzy Gillespie, Billy Eckstein, Lionel Hampton, Steve Gibson and the Red Caps. It was a song called Shaboom by the Cadets and they lived right down the street from me on Young Avenue. So there was a lot of people around you. You don't really think too much about them being celebrities because they come out in the street, talk to you, and everybody was having a good time. And it seemed like the entertainment industry was really gearing up for some good times. By 1963, there were no less than five major amusement centers offering over 100 rides and attractions on the boardwalk. In 1969, the Maury Brothers opened Surfside Pier, featuring a giant slide called the Wipeout. In uh, 1968, they were vacationing um, down in South Florida, and they saw a big, giant slide, the one that's there today at Maury's Pier. Uh, and it was something really, quite frankly, as casual as saying, wow, that would work well in Wildwood. Neither one of, neither one of them were in the business. They really had really no intention to sort of necessarily fully change business direction. Um, but in 1969, it opened. And uh, from there, it's really just been, you know, continuing to um, sort of reinvent itself and, and grow every year. that we, um, for a while, called Mariner's Landing, became available. Uh, and that was part of the whole Cedar Skellinger um, sale. So the Nichols acquired the west side of the boardwalk, and uh, the Maury family acquired the east side of the boardwalk, which was then, which was then Marine Pier. In 1975, we developed Nichols Midway Pier, which was a, uh, a concept for a castle. The authenticness of the castle was an attempt to make it as real looking as possible. And maybe me being biased because I was one of the actual builders of it, I believe that it does look very authentic. The rooms inside are very authentic. All the walls are hand carved foam to make it look like stone. Uh, some of the uh, artwork in there could be considered antiques today. And there's various rooms that you go through experiencing different types of situations. People have their heads cut off, uh, rooms that look like it's raining in there. It's an interesting experience, and I guess when people stop wanting to be scared, then those kind of rides will not exist anymore, but I don't see that happening in, any, in the near future. The boardwalk is really about sort of simple, old-fashioned fun. You know, it's not about wowing people with the latest technology. You may use technology to allow them to, to wow them, but it's the people and it's the children that are the attraction for the parents, not the piece of equipment necessarily that is providing the attraction. The equipment is really the enabler to bring the families together to enjoy each other. For over a century, the Wildwoods have been the vacation destination for generations of families. While the sounds of the steam engine and trolley have been quiet for many years, 
Wildwood's gently sloping beach, exceptional boardwalk and amusement piers continue to beckon millions of vacationers every summer. With recent redevelopment and yearly beach expansion, the Wildwoods will continue to be one of America's most beloved seashore resorts. City Hall had a room upstairs on the second floor, they called it a museum. Uh, originally it was well taken care of by the fellow who founded it, George, George F. Boyer. We knew right away that that wasn't the right spot because City Hall was closed at night and on weekends, so pretty much killed the best time to go to a museum. And uh, so with that we went uh, literally begging and borrowing to get another building. And, we were lucky enough to find uh, a building on the mall. Um, used to be the old funeral power, Inger, Ingersoll's funeral power. We have a very good volunteer fire department. Instead of one night having a drill, um, they just got a, a half a dozen trucks and all I had to do was point to where I wanted the stuff and it was like a miracle. So we got all the heavy cases over and, and then uh, opening day we had a um, a human uh, chain, and uh, we actually pass just uh, uh, some of the pictures and artifacts over and uh, pass them on over to the museum. And uh, I thought that was really a, a very touching final. And it was uh, the beginning of uh, a labor of love. And uh, I never thought I'd have to say, but we're actually running out of room. <laughs> you know? People are faithfully donating stuff. Um, you have people come here for the summer. Maybe the fellow was a lifeguard. Um, maybe the lady's grandmother owned a rooming house or some, where they have some artifacts or some pictures or whatever miscellaneous. And, and they say, you know, next year when they come back, they will gladly donate it. And they faithfully, you know, drag it back here and proudly present it to us. And, uh, so we've, we've uh, accumulated a, a, lot of, a lot of items. In fact, uh, I can look anybody in the eye, and most, most of the others will concede that uh, you know, we have one of the best museums in the county, if not the state.